Growing up in Puerto Rico, it's, I think, uh, what uh, gave me a basis for my roots, my identity. Um, it's a very lush place. I grew up going to waterfalls, rivers, uh, forest, and of course the ocean, coral reef with my father. It's an island of farmers, uh, fishermen. Of course, it has a city part. But it's a place that has been mixing and blending forever. Uh, there's all these symbiotic relationships between different cultures, all these syncretisms, uh, which were organic, which are organic to the island, but they also surrounded me unconsciously. Only in retrospect, as I get older, I see the huge impact that it had, especially the the lushness of the place. And I think there's incredible cultures as well. I say it's a place that's been mixing and blending or mixing and bending for centuries because it was a scholar for, from Harvard, Robert Ferris Thompson, that he wrote about my work. And he said that the Caribbean was a school uh, for learning for me. It's, uh, it's really what shaped uh, the roots of, of what my work is about. And I strongly believe so. I think I always knew I wanted to be doing creative things. When you're young or very young, you don't know what an artist is. Uh, but soon when I found out, uh, especially with my grandmother, shared with me a, a reader digest of Frida Kahlo. And that I quickly understood what an artist was. So I kind of like understood that I wanted to be an artist with the power and the force of Frida Kahlo for a very young kid. Uh, but I wasn't sure which discipline, if architecture, design, painting, I always knew I wanted to uh, paint. So I think that kind of like sets me up in the visual arts realm. And very early on in Puerto Rico, my parents were sensitive enough with the little income they had that, that uh, it was important to foster that, so I took uh, after-school classes in Puerto Rico with a master called Rechani and Margot, very early on, uh, which I think is very important. Parents to be looking at, you know, what, what, I, what, I, what, I, what is the kid sensitive to? Because otherwise you have to do all that homework when you're old and say, what was it that I liked to do when I was young? Mm -hmm. So that was an advantage. And um, I, I can think that I've been creating, being an artist uh, since very early on. Of course, school starts forming you and you start defining uh, my degrees in design. I was terrified of, of, of having a degree uh, as a fine artist. Uh, I studied architecture as well. I think two, three years of architecture before switching to design. I went to art school. Um, but I like to express myself in, 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 in almost all disciplines that are creative. So I'm decorating a, a table, conceptualizing it, uh, designing a chair. Um, it's the visual realm. I, I, I think like, like most visual artists, what takes us there is that the best way we can express ourselves is with a visual image. Not with what I'm doing right now words that's for others but what I really fully want to tell you is uh, is through, through my imagery I think uh, it's a very personal journey and for me um, it's internal I felt when I found my voice my language on my own I mean, of course, with friends and scholars. Um, I feel I found myself once I'm free to express myself whichever way I want to. Um, one thing is the creative process in the artist studio. Uh, the other thing is the business of art. That's up for other people to decide. I'm not much interested in that aspect. 
even though economically it helps in many ways, it allows me the freedom to create more projects to travel that I love traveling so much. But um, generally speaking, when I found my voice, and that took many years, uh, embracing who you are, the uh, the things you inherited, your identity, I always like to talk about that. I, because I think with my research studies, artists do find their voice once they embrace their immediate surroundings, their past, their heritage, their culture. And that's a very personal element transcend and in a way makes your work a little bit universal. But the very, very, very personal, the good and the bad, is part of the root of, of, of how you uh, arrive to that place. Keith Haring once says the primitive will always make us new. That had beautiful connotations for me. Uh, of course, going to the primitive, you always find something inspiring. I like to say once you find your roots, once you find your, once you find your source, the possibilities are, are infinite. But you have to find the roots. You have to find who or what makes you unique. And it's, it's not that difficult. What makes you unique is your circumstances, whichever they are, and the culture that you were born into, uh, or the one that you have decided to possess, the one that attracts you. In my case, it's Puerto Rico, Cuba, Miami. Those are the places I live. I don't live in New York. I'm not an artist informed by the culture of New York. I could adopt that and research it and own it. But I'm more, the places I have owned is more Greece and more Mexico. We were talking about that earlier. Um, so I, I think I arrived uh, when, for me, that I feel in a comfortable place. Uh, when I found my voice. And my voice has to do with issues of memory, as you're familiar with. Uh, after many years, after art school working in the studio, I realized what was the common element, the, co the common uh, driving force behind my work. And it's memories and things that stay with me, uh, that persist in my mind and they want to be expressed, they want to be touched, they want to be turned three-dimensionally. I explore issues of memory, so I take the past and I present, them, present it in a new context, uh, mostly. I love objects and I love the memory embedded in objects. So I use objects and I activate them to release the memory that is uh, embedded in them. I'm, um, I'm an optimist, I come from a generation of optimism, they call it the architecture of optimism. Uh, my generation, the future always looked brighter. Uh, so that also permeates in my work. I'm a poet in a way, romantic, nostalgic. Um, and those are things that help shape my, shape my voice to this day. The Pelican Passage was a commissioned work by Faena Arts Foundation. It was very, very exciting. It was allowed, allowed a lot of freedom to do it. I think what happened with that project was, as I was talking before, owning your, your history, owning your identity, um, and getting inspired from it presenting the past in a new context, the Pelican Passage allowed me to do that. Let me explain myself. It's a, I always wanted to do a giant piñata. I grew up with piñatas, actually the same piñata year after year that my mother, it would break and there wasn't much of a budget and my mother would change the decoration and put strings again. And I can see it in the photo albums. I actually asked my mom, it's like, Mom, it's so great, you always got me a new piñata when I was a little kid. He said, no, it was the same one, we just fixed it. So, moments of joy that stay there, it's emotional. So, I also grew up with floats, embracing your own culture, embracing the surroundings in Puerto Rico. Uh, the Pelican Passage was also a float. Uh, the Pelican Passage 
was a procession. I grew up with that as well. And even though these are items that some people in the status quo of the art world will dismiss, they're real to me. So it doesn't matter. It's, it's the need for me to express myself overrides any of the rules of the art world. And the curator was great because she, I think it's one of the first artists that was looking at these type of traditions like processions as an art form and then she contemporized the idea. So I had my piñata, I had my float, I had my procession, I had a cake as well because the piñata did look like a cake. That's something else that my mother would do every year. A, one of those homemade cakes that she would decorate slightly different every year. And and I think with that piece, that uh, that commission, many things came together for me that sometimes are very difficult to get opportunities in the art world like that. To do a procession, piñata, a cake, a, a float. This is not uh, very common. And um, it was joyful. We uh, produced a choreography with it. Some of my main art patrons actually that I such a big part of my life and, and Albertos uh, uh, were actually part of, of the procession. We did customs for them as well. In general, you know, the more I look at my work and that piece, I also see that my work is informed by my own experiences, not necessarily the other way around. It's not art informing art, but actually my own personal journey informing my work. Currently, I'm working uh, with a video projections inspired or informed by my previous work. It's kind of like my rule. When I do video art, the derivative has to be an existing work of art. It's very hard for me to think of something uh, that exists just in the digital world. So my rule is that it must be derivative of something that I have already done. So the future eternal, it's a video um, that is projected into the iconic Red Sea Orb in Miami Beach. Miami Beach is very special to me because it's where my first studio was in Perfect Utopia for many, many years. Uh, and I worked there, developed myself and found my voice over there in Perfect Utopia during the South Beach 80s and 90s years. We call it the South Beach Underground. Actually, our foundation is doing a book about that period. Um, so, the Future Eternal is a video, it's a digital video projection uh, reflected into the Betsy Orb, which is in an alley behind the Betsy Hotel and the Carlton Hotel. It's informed by this concept that I was trying to define about how constant we live in the future, not so much even in the present and a little bit on the past. The full name of the piece is actually Process Ritual, The Future Eternal. And it deals with, with um, this conflicting observation, if I may say, that in North America, people are eternally living in the future. You have another exhibit and during the opening when you're having your little tequila show they're asking you and when is your next exhibit which is kind and generous but it's a habit you win an academy award and when is your next movie no so it's kind of like an observation on that i do it with stars it's uh it's uh alluding to the future they're very symbolic of that but the stars in this digital uh, video actually come from uh, my collection of tree toppers. I think you're familiar with that series, the actual physical series uh, called The Future Eternal. I collected hundreds of tree toppers uh, because in Puerto Rico during Christmas we used to go uh, uh, on parrandas, which are the Latin version of Christmas carols of sorts, but with tumbadoras, maracas, uh, and it's a beautiful tradition and you will wake up people during the holidays 
to have food, alcohol ready for you at two, three o'clock in the morning. And as a, ch as a kid, as a child, my main thing was to run and see the Christmas tree and see what was on top, which was these magical objects uh, loaded with light and hope and future. And as, grew up all, as I grew up older, I started collecting those and I have hundreds and hundreds of them, different forms and shapes. Eventually an artwork came out, which is the future eternal and the, and the one projected at the orb is the digital, digitized version of the actual work. Well, here we go, connecting the past, a childhood memory that is very dear to me, uh, and presenting it in a new context. These are no longer three toppers now. They're decorating an orb in an alley, and some of the works from the series are actually became sculptural assemblages. So they kind of like lose their original purpose. And when I say like uh, taking an object that is embedded with memory and activating the memory in it, that's what I see in this work. It's, it's very clear to me, still following that path. Transforming an object from the past and presenting it in a new context. See how hard it is to put words in artists? <laughs> Isn't it better if I show you the work and this is what I want to say? <laughs> I don't that have to great. go through this. That was great. So Miami was very um, uh, difficult for me when I first moved here in the 80s because I missed, of course, Puerto Rico, Old San Juan, uh, a very old colonial city. I miss the, the Taino culture, or the, the native Puerto Rican people. I was very um, immersed in that, grew up on that, the food. And uh, I found Miami extremely boring back then. Uh, you know, I dedicated myself basically to go to school. And at one moment, there was this great artist named Crystal and John Claude, and uh, they presented the surrounded islands as beautiful pink islands on Biscayne Bay, fuchsia color that I'll never forget. I volunteered there, kind of like illegally, because I was kind of like a bad boy in a, arts in a high school. And um, when I was there at the at Pelican Island and saw these artists and this fuchsia fabric, I'll never forget. And I, I the first time, and I was young, I was like 15. The first time I saw Miami as a muse, I saw an artist using Miami as a muse. I, I actually became groupies uh, with some other people. We will show up in Ocean Drive at the Leslie Hotel, which is where Chris and your club were staying. And that's the first time I saw Ocean Drive. I was young. It, it, was, it is then when I decided that when I finished art school, I was coming to Miami Beach to this city, uh, beach city, beautiful and beautiful ruins, uh, but so hopeful with this Jetsonian architecture, Maurice Lapidus that designed the Fontainebleau Hilton eventually became a friend and stopped by my studio. So I built a story there, I started building a story that started um, influencing my, my earlier work with all the syncretic cultures of Puerto Rico and the Caribbean and then this futuristic city. So it was Crystal that made me see Miami as a muse. And I had a great friend too, as she always talked about Miami in the 80s and 90s with that force. And she used to say, I don't know if it was her, but it was something like, uh, the best thing about Miami is that it's so close to the United States, you know? And that has very deep connotations, no? And, so Miami has been uh, a muse for me and for many artists. I stayed, I insisted, it reflects on my work, the good and the bad, how it, how it should be. And I really didn't try to become something that I wasn't, you know. I was an artist born and raised in Puerto Rico, Cuban parents with a lot of Afro-Cuban influences, Afro-Caribbean influences, in love with Greece, Mexico, and surrounded and empapado de, de Miami. So uh, the Betancourt La Torre Foundation, it's a non-for-profit 
that Alberto La Torre, architect, and he's actually collaborates with a lot of my artwork as well, and he's a studio director. Um, we created as a way to help um, um, support up and coming artists from the Caribbean basin and Miami. Uh, we one of the projects we work with was helping artists uh, during Hurricane Maria in Puerto Rico, and recently during COVID, uh, we delivered around 20, 30 uh, grants, cash grants, to help artists that uh, were economically handicapped during the the pandemic. We're working on a future project, a uh, cultural project to document document a specific period in in Miami. It's called uh, South Beach, the last underground. And um, we look forward to uh, being able to raise more funds so we can get involved uh, supporting up and coming artists. It's important to me in the sense that when I was an up and coming artist, the idea of someone purchasing my work or just even a cash reward made huge, made a huge difference, you know? So the mission of the foundation is that it's actually trying to help in the most simplistic way, artists, which as I know myself, they mostly just want to be in their studio or outdoors or wherever it is doing their artwork, no? Uh, and you need freedom, and uh, in a way you need some uh, economic freedom also to do that, to develop your own voice. It helped me when I was young, it helped me when people would come, uh, purchase my work. It's a way of, without, or a cliche, it's a way of giving back, in, a, in the way that I learned that it helped me. It's very dear to Albert and I, the foundation. I'm looking forward to uh, the release of the book Making Miami, which is part of an exhibit uh, that will be uh, happening during our Basel week in the Design District. The book is important for me because it helps or attempts to define the Miami art scene. There's very little, unfortunately, very little academic research or records of this. Uh, so I'm looking forward very much to that. I have an essay in there in which I explore or I go through the journey of living in Miami from the 80s to uh, to the present. Um, I have an exhibit coming up in Mexico, in Carreges, uh, Fundación Carreges. It's a solo show. I've been working for the last three, four months in that project. I work also part of the re residence uh, program with artists there with uh, kids from the Las Comunidades, uh, Los Pueblos, alrededor de Carreges. That was quite beautiful and I can't wait to see all these kids again. They actually helped me put the show together. Um, there's two places that I enjoy, many places I enjoy in Miami, but I'll give you these two, of course, Stillsville. Uh, you need a boat or a kayak to get there. Uh, Miami is one of these places that I consider almost an island because it's surrounded by water almost everywhere. And north of here, well, you know, I-95 is like a barrier. The rest is like the Gulf and uh, Florida, South Florida, no? It's the Gulf of Mexico and the Atlantic Ocean. So it's, it's, it's really Miami from the ocean. It's like us, the land of us. And Stillsville has great history and it's quiet and it's so still. Still spill, it's so still. <laughs> and, uh, and right behind the studio here, there's the St. Mary's uh, Cathedral, which has one of my, I'm sharing this in here, one of my favorite quiet places in all of Miami, the chapel. It's quite spectacular, quite moving. It has uh, a wall to wall stained glass of the deepest shades of blues and cobalt blues and uh, some highlights in, in, in red and it's like a like a blue forest. I go in there a lot. I take some of my friends. It's one of the secrets of many that are in Miami. It's quite spectacular. It's one of my, my favorite places in in the world, being in there. And uh, 
Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Thank you so much. You're welcome very much.